right, so here in chapter 15, we are going to be talking about microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. So we're going to be taking a look at how microbes uh, become pathogenic inside of our bodies. So first, let's talk about what an infectious disease is. So a disease first, um, not infectious, but just disease, is any condition in which the normal structures or functions of the body are damaged or impaired. Um, so the reason that it's important to mention this, so dis-ease is dis-ease in the body, anything that is not at ease in the body, so something that is different, where something that is normally a certain way or a normal function is changed or impaired. So of course this doesn't mean that everything is an infectious disease. We have genetic diseases, so those are passed down, so that is also a disease, but it's not an infectious disease. We have um, environmental causes for particular diseases, um, so damage from the environment. It doesn't mean it's infectious, um, it's just from the environment, or something like an inappropriate immune response. Um, so in that case, the immune response is overwhelming, you know, something similar to allergies, for example, um, where we just have this small haptin. And the body's response to that is overwhelming, um, causing allergies and some other examples like that. So then we can mention what an infection is. So it's related to infectious diseases. So an infection is successful colonization of a host by a microorganism. So something that causes disease, so by a pathogen. So an infection is when a particular pathogen has successfully colonized, and when it has successfully colonized, that's when we call it an infection, and that's because this is when it's going to lead to disease or disease. This is when we actually see those signs and symptoms. So a couple of bacteria or a couple of a microorganism in the body is not considered an infection. It's only when there's successful colonization, which means that it's producing some different signs or symptoms. And so then we have an infectious disease. So any condition where our normal structure or function is impaired or damaged due to a successful colonization of the host by a microorganism. So we said that there are signs and symptoms uh, due to the successful colonization by a microorganism. So when we talk about signs of a disease, what we're talking about are things that are objective and measurable and they can be directly observed by a clinician. Um, so some examples of this would be like the typical vital signs. So vital signs, as their name implies here, they have signs in the name, are signs of disease. So this would affect body temperature, for example. So this is something that is objective. Um, we don't have any subjective um, opinion about body temperature. Is it elevated or is it not? Um, so uh, the body temperature, which is typically about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and so if it's different from that, that would be a, a sign of disease. Uh, the heart rate, which is typically around 60 to 100 beats per minute. Uh, breathing rate, <clears throat> excuse me, breathing rate changing. So if there's increased breathing uh, or decreased breathing, which is typically 12 to 18 breaths per minute, um, something like blood pressure, so you know about the 90 over 60 to 120 over 80. Um, so these are different signs, and these are why these vital signs are taken when someone goes to see a clinician. It's because they can give information that is measurable, directly observed, and objective. Um, so vital signs or changes to these vital signs can be indicative of disease. So that's the first step when you visit a clinician. Um, and then there are some that are beyond those vital signs. So these other signs here, like antibodies in the serum, these would be more like lab tests. Um, so then there are various lab tests that would be a sign of disease because, again, it's objective and measurable, so they can look at that lab test and say yes this or no that. Um, and then that would be another sign of disease. Then we have symptoms of disease. <clears throat> so symptoms are felt or experienced by the patient, but these are subjective. So uh, you can't measure this as a clinician. So some examples of symptoms are nausea. You know, when you go in, you're the person that's ill, you can feel the nausea, but there's no way for a doctor or a clinician to measure nausea. Um, same thing with loss of appetite or pain, uh, for example. That's why we have those pain charts, you know, the pain scale that's the, the frowny person all the way up to the happy person and everything in between, and they say, where are you feeling on this level? Because that's the only way we can try to take a symptom and turn it into a sign by having some sort of objective way to measure that. Of course, that's completely subjective, but it's trying to help in that way and, and give something a little bit um, more measurable for a clinician. And that's the, the Wong Baker Faces pain rating scale um, to try to help to determine what kind of illness is happening or the severity of the illness based on some symptoms. 
Um, so trying to measure pain, for example. <clears throat> so when we talk about infectious diseases then our characteristics of them, we have both signs and symptoms due to this colonization. So signs being measurable and symptoms not. So then when we are classifying these things, when we say this is happening, this is not, uh, doing various lab tests and things, then we can say that there is a syndrome, for example. Um, so a syndrome is a specific group of signs and symptoms that are characteristic of a particular disease. Um, so you have a syndrome if you have a particular group of these signs and symptoms. So um, some nomenclature of some syndromes, for example, naming of these <coughs> syndrome, syndromes, syndromes, um, and nomenclature based on the, those things. So here you should be familiar with some of these terms here. So if it has cyto at the beginning, um, then that's related to the cell. And we know that um, from cytoplasm, for example, is the plasm of the cell, uh, the goo inside the cell. So that's also similar for symptoms um, and different syndromes. So cytopenia is the reduction of the number of blood cells. <clears throat> uh, hepat is related to the liver. So hepatitis tells us that that's inflammation of the liver. And we know it's inflammation because if we go down here, itis is inflammation. So if we combine the hepat and itis, we have hepatitis. And when we hear that, we now know that that's inflammation of the liver. So back up here, we have pathy, which is related to disease. So neuropathy is a disease that affects the nervous system, so neurons or nerves. Emia is related to the blood. Bacteremia is going to be the presence of bacteria in the blood. Lysis means destruction or breaking down. So we already kind of know that because cytolysis, for example, we know is cyto for the cell and lysis. Oma is related to a tumor. So lymphoma is a tumor or a cancer in the lymphatic system, the lymph part. Osis is diseased or an abnormal condition. So leukocytosis. So leuco meaning white blood cells or leukocytes and cyto meaning cell. So leukocytes are white blood cells. And then osis is an abnormal so abnormally high number of white blood cells. And then lastly, derma is related to the skin. And so carotiderma is <clears throat> a thickening of the skin because derma is related to the skin and carotid is related to keratin, uh, which is what is made in the skin cells. <clears throat> So these are just some very simple examples that the text has. That's why it's a, from an image from the text. So you should be familiar with these, and, and there are many, many more, but these are just kind of a sampling of them. So <clears throat> these clinicians then are going to rely on both these signs and asking questions, so related to these symptoms. So they'll take a look at the signs, they'll take a look at the symptoms, but then they also consider things like medical history um, and a patient's recent activities, for example. Of course, that would be important because if they were recently traveling and we know that there's some sort of outbreak somewhere, um, that is also relevant information. And the reason that we do all of these other things with medical history and recent activities um, and asking these questions is because their different microorganisms can cause very similar signs and symptoms. And I think that we all generally know that, you know, because when we're sick, for example, we may um, have a headache um, or we may have a stuffy nose. Uh, we may have a cough or a sore throat. And we find that with lots of different illnesses. Um, or, for example, diarrhea. We can have that with different bacterial illnesses, different viral, different parasites, and those are listed here. Um, so that's the, the same um, sign or symptom, and it's because of many, many different types of organisms. And here, with this example with diarrhea, we're looking at bacterial, viral, and even parasitic. So there's a huge or a wide range of organisms that can provide those um, different signs and symptoms. However, sometimes things are asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic is also called subclinical. And these are diseases that do not present any noticeable signs or symptoms. So sometimes we can still be ill, but we don't actually notice these signs or symptoms. We don't, we're not seeing a change in the blood pressure or a change in the temperature. We don't have a stuffy nose or a stomach ache or something. And an example of this would be herpes simplex virus. So most people don't know that they have herpes simplex. Um, this is also another example would be HPV. 
most people are carrying HPV or have HPV infection, but most don't know that um, because the majority of the population doesn't ever have a reaction or any problem with that. Um, so it's enough to um, colonize, but there are no signs or symptoms, and so they're asymptomatic. So now we're going to kind of talk about different terms related to um, different diseases um, in related to infectious diseases. So first of all, our definition of an infectious disease is any disease caused by the direct effect of a pathogen. Um, so remember, a pathogen is any microorganism that can cause disease. So we're saying any disease that's caused by a pathogen is an infectious disease. So we have some that are cellular, like our bacteria is a pathogen, or they're very there are many pathogenic bacteria that cause disease. When they do, that's infectious. Uh, parasites, fungi, or are acellular. So viruses, also viroids or prions that we've spoken about. All of these things are infectious diseases because they are pathogens. So we kind of already know that with like bacteria and viruses and stuff. Um, but just keep in mind that even things like prions um, are pathogens and they can cause infectious disease. Then we have our non-infectious diseases. So these aren't caused by pathogens. So these are some of the other ones that we spoke about, like genetic diseases or something that's caused by the environment or the immune response. So an example that the text gives is sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is when the red blood cells are in the shape of a sickle. And when this happens, they're also very rigid. It's because of the proteins within the blood cells. And they, the proteins are folded differently. And when they do that, they become rigid and kind of in this sickle shell, cell shape. And this actually causes problem because it does not hold as much oxygen. <clears throat> um, so all of the, the tissues of the body are not getting as much oxygen as they normally would. But then also because of their stiffness, they're not able to squish and squeeze through the tiny capillary openings, um, the, the lumen of the capillaries. And so they can oftentimes get stuck in there and then cause some blockages and some decreased blood flow. Um, so that is a disease, um, but it's not an infectious disease. Then we have our different terms related to these things. So we have what's called a communicable disease. If a disease is communicable, this is capable of being spread from person to person. So this can be done either by direct or indirect mechanisms, which we'll talk about in more detail. Um, so communicable is related to the community. And when it's related to the community, that means it can be spread from person to person. Now, if it's non-communicable, that means it can't be spread from person to person. Um, and an example of this would be like C. tetany infection. So if we're getting tetanus, then those are endospores that are from the soil, and then they get in through a skin wound, and then they are going to no longer be spores, they'll become vegetative, and then they'll infect the body or they'll colonize the body. But this is non-communicable. You can't prep... Um, you can't pass that from person to person. You have to get it from the soil, for example. So another term is contagious. And if a disease is contagious, what that means is it's easily spread from person to person. Um, so not all diseases are equally contagious. And so we would say something is contagious if it's easily spread. If it's something that's not very easily spread, then that would not be considered a contagious disease. And maybe um, we kind of know that intuitively. We think of things like a, the common cold or the flu or something like that as a contagious disease um, versus some others that are more difficult. We don't think of um, HIV, for example, as a very contagious disease. Uh, maybe some people do, but um, it's not something that we see very, very often and it's easy to pass around. And that's because it's not spread through simple things like shaking hands or giving hugs or something. So um, this can be related specifically to how a disease is spread. So for example, um, some highly contagious measles are spread by inhaling droplets from an infected person. So that's really, really easy to get. So it's highly contagious, for example, um, versus gonorrhea, which is spread by close intimate contact. So some sort of sexual contact, which, so it's contagious. It can, it can spread from person to person um, relatively easily, but it's not as contagious as the measles, for example. The next term is iatrogenic diseases. An iatrogenic disease is one that's contracted as a result of a medical procedure. Um, so the medical procedure would not be something that is specifically related to um, an infectious disease. This could be after a wound treatment. Um, so somebody gets cut, they go into the hospital, 
Um, and then while they're in the hospital having a procedure to fix that cut, they can get a disease, and that would be an iatrogenic disease. We also see these with catheters, catheterization. Um, so when somebody's using a catheter, because of a medical procedure, they can oftentimes get an iatrogenic disease or any other type of surgery. So any surgery at all that's happening is a medical procedure. If then they get a disease due to a microorganism, it's an iatrogenic disease. This is where our wound or the surgical site becomes infected. And some examples of how this would happen is bandages of treated skin can become contaminated by um, clostridium perfringens. And when this becomes infected or contaminated with clostridium perfringens, these band-aids or bandages oftentimes will stay on for long periods of time. And then what that can do is it becomes a rather large infection, and then they can acquire necrotizing fasciitis, which is death of the tissue. And so um, in wounds, that's why we want to make sure that we keep wounds clean and we dress them. And, and when anybody has a, a surgical procedure, they always send the person home with the um, instructions on how to take care of the wound because they don't want something like this to happen where all of the tissue around this wound now starts to die and it can't come back. Um, so people can lose fingers and toes and limbs and things like that because of this. Another term is nosocomial. So if we're talking about a nosocomial disease, a nosocomial disease is one that's acquired in a hospital setting. Um, so we just spoke about iatrogenic diseases, and that's any sort of thing relating to a medical procedure. It doesn't have to be in a hospital. Nosocomial diseases are in a hospital. So this, however, doesn't have to be related to the procedure that they were having. This could be getting it from other sick people. So you're in the hospital, you go in with some particular issue, and then when you come out or later on, you end up being infected with a microorganism, so from other sick patients. Uh, this can be transmitted via improperly sterilized equipment, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it is somebody coughing and you walk by and you're in the hospital. It could be because the equipment isn't sterilized. Um, also related to interacting with different things that other people interact with that might not get cleaned all that often or very well, like call buttons or door handles or sheets or you know the bathrooms or something like that. Also, you can get this from clinicians or nurses not washing their hands properly. So that's a big important thing, you know, and that's why we see lots of signs even just in restaurants that say, you know, you know employees need to wash their hands and things like that um, is because of passing those along. Of course, that's not a hospital, so that's not related to this. But in that same way, it's important that um, clinicians and nurses wash their hands properly. <clears throat> And also because when we're talking about hospitals, oftentimes patients have weakened immune systems already. And once one goes in with a weakened immune system, then they're more susceptible to these diseases. So unfortunately, when we're talking about a nosocomial disease, oftentimes what we're talking about is a disease that is drug resistant or antibiotic resistant. And that is because oftentimes there are lots of people in the hospital. Um, they're all being prescribed different antibiotics and given different antibiotics. And so um, the organisms that are in their body, as they've been taking these antibiotics, maybe they just got it, but maybe they're coming back for a follow-up, um, and they still have that bacteria in their body, but they're on antibiotics. They're taking the antibiotics, and the illness isn't going away, and that's because it is resistant to those antibiotics. So then that person's going into the hospital and say they're going to be interacting in the same space, the same waiting area as another person that had a different infection, a uh, different illness, <clears throat> and they are also taking antibiotics, a different antibiotic, and they're not getting any better, and that's because the particular organism that they are infected with that's causing their signs and symptoms uh, are resistant to that antibiotic. But now these two people with different antibiotics and different illnesses are in the same room, and they are perhaps coughing or sneezing or something like that, and they can pass their diseases or their infections to the opposite person. And now that person has the ability to have two different organisms in their body, so now they have um, acquired a nosocomial disease, meaning they've gotten, they have become ill with a different organism causing a different disease. But now the problem is, is that they have two organisms in their body that are resistant to two different antibiotics, for example. Um, and then those organisms, as we have spoken about previously, can do things like conjugation um, or <clears throat> transduction, 
And when they do this, then they're going to be exchanging genetic information. And perhaps now both of these organisms will exchange genetic information. And when they do that now, they'll both be resistant to both of those antibiotics rather than just being resistant to one. Um, and so then nosocomial diseases are very, very dangerous because a lot of times they are being passed on and they have antibiotic resistance because of the prevalence of antibiotics that we see in hospital settings. Uh, the last term is a zoonotic disease. So zoonosis is a term related to when diseases are transmitted from animals to humans. Um, so I think the largest example we have of a zoonotic disease is rabies. That's a very easy one to think of because when we think of rabies, it's a viral disease and it's transmitted to humans through a bite um, or just contact with the saliva from an animal that's infected with rabies. So if we think um, of a dog, for example, that has rabies, we kind of already know that that dog has to bite us and then it can pass rabies along and that's a zoonotic disease. Um, another example, though, that may not be as familiar or um, on the top of the brain when we think about this is an arthropod transmission. So, for example, yellow fever, um, because a mosquito is biting one person, um, and then they have it in them, and then they bite the next person. Um, so, or not, the, not the first one's not a person, sorry. They get it from an animal, and then that's transmitted to a person after the mosquito then bites a person, because they bite animals and, and people. Uh, or Rocky Mountain Spotted feeder, Fever. So this is from an infected tick. So we see this oftentimes where the ticks are on animals in the woods, and then the ticks get to a human, and then they pass that along. Another one is malaria. So a bite from a mosquito. Um, when that mosquito goes from an animal to a human, then it passes it. It's a zoonotic disease. All right, so now we are going to talk about the different periods of disease. <clears throat> so rather than talking about how bacteria grow or viruses grow, which we've spoken about in the different um, ways or curves for growth, now what we're going to talk about is our periods of disease is what they're called, so the different time frames here. And those periods are incubation, prodromal, illness, decline, and convalescence. And you can see that here. So over here is the number of pathogen particles, and that is in red. And then we have time. So as we're moving along here, they're in order. So we have our incubation period where we can see the number of pathogens is pretty low at this point, but then it increases through the prodromal period. Then we have our period of illness, then decline, you can see the numbers of particles are going down, and then period of convalescence, and we're going to talk about all of those things. The blue line is the severity of the symptoms, and we can see that the severity of the symptoms correlate with the number of pathogens. So the first one is the incubation period, and this is, of course, after the initial entry of the pathogen into the host, and then that pathogen is going to begin multiplying. So we have kind of this low um, level of pathogen, and that's because it's incubating, um, it is starting to multiply. And this is similar to what we see when we start a new culture, and we've spoken about bacterial growth, is that the bacteria have now moved into, let's say in this example, a bacteria has moved into a new host, it needs to get comfortable, kind of get where it's going, settle in, and then start dividing. So at this point, the patient is unaware that the disease is developing, um, because it's at such a low level, they haven't turned on all of their virulence information yet or done their um, virulence, whatever that is, and um, started to cause those signs and symptoms. So the patient's unaware that it's developing their insufficient numbers of pathogen particles, whether we're talking about cells or viruses, to cause these signs or symptoms. So at this point, we don't even know that they're in there. The periods vary depending on the um, organism oftentimes and also the health of the host. Um, so sometimes the period for incubation is just a day or two. This is in an acute disease, so a day or two, and then we're moving on to the next period. Sometimes it takes months or years, and this is when we see a chronic disease, so a disease that's going to last quite some time or a lifetime. The length of period, then, is going to be determined by several things, and I already mentioned some of these. So this, one is the strength of the pathogen, um, so how healthy that pathogen is, like what kind of pathogen it is, if it's a really strong pathogen. Um, also, the strength of the immune system, that's one I already mentioned, where it depends on the host uh, immune system. 
if the person is um, young and healthy and eating good things and exercising and sleeping and all these things, and then they acquire a pathogen, their body likely will be able to fight it off relatively easily or easier than somebody that might be um, older, have other diseases that they're working on. Diseases meaning something like heart disease, for example, not um, infectious disease. <clears throat> um, or somebody that is you know, in the hospital already fighting something or somebody that's immunocompromised. Um, also, we need to take into consideration for the length of period of time for this, the site of infection. Um, so that would vary greatly if it's getting inside the body and infecting the body or straight into the bloodstream, for example. The type of infection. So we're talking about the different organism here. So not just the strength of the organism, um, but what kind of organism it is, what type of infection it is and the size of the infectious dose received, right? So if we just get, you know, a bacteria or two, our period for incubation might be longer before we move into the prodromal, prodromal period um, versus if, for whatever reason, we got a very, very large amount, um, then it might be a shorter amount of time. So then the next section here, the next period, is the prodromal period. And this is when the pathogen continues to multiply, and this is right when the host starts to experience these general signs and symptoms. So this I often think of as when a person is saying, like, I think I'm starting to come down with something. I'm, I'm just not feeling right. I'm a little bit tired, or I'm a little stuffy, or I'm a little foggy in the head. Um, this is the prodromal period. <clears throat> So at this point, we have activation of the immune system, and this is when we're going to start to uh, increase that temperature and start to go toward a fever. This is when we start to feel painful, um, kind of something's uncomfortable, soreness, um, some swelling is starting at this point, although we might not um, notice it, not something like our hand completely swelling up, but um, some swelling within the body and some inflammation. At this point, however, even if you went to the doctor and you were saying, you know, I'm just kind of not feeling right, it's too general to know what particular disease it would be based on those signs and symptoms. So this is in the prodromal period. And likely even a sample at this point might not provide um, enough for it to be identified, even regardless of those symptoms that you might be experiencing. So the next period is our period of illness. So we can see our incubation period where we have low numbers here and then they start to increase because they're multiplying. Prodromal period, we see a, a pretty good increase here, but not enough to cause these big signs and symptoms. And then we get to our period of illness. And this is when we have the signs and the symptoms are most obvious and most severe. Um, this is, you know, when we would say I'm sick and I'm fighting something off and I'm not going to work or to school or whatever it is because I am feeling unwell. So you can see the number of pathogens here is really, really, really high comparatively, even in that, in that section, um, they've increased a lot. <clears throat> and then of course we peak here because this is when it's most severe is when we're actually ill. After that, then, we see our period of decline. Um, this is when our number of pathogen particles is starting to decrease. So we've moved up through our period of illness. And then once we have reached that peak, we start to come down. And then that's our period of decline, as the name implies. This is when our signs and symptoms begin to decline as well. So since we don't have as many of the pathogen in the body, then the signs and symptoms go down. Um, this, however, is when... <clears throat> We're still not feeling well, um, and we're still saying, you know, but at this point we're saying, oh, I'm getting over this thing, or, you know, you're, you're going to work or going to school, but you're kind of keeping your distance, or, you know, you're, you're still kind of carrying around those cough drops or carrying around, you know, whatever it is. So um, not the worst, uh, but still not feeling very well. At this point, uh, a, period, a person is still susceptible uh, to a secondary infection because the immune system is still very weak. So even though we've gotten past the peak number of pathogens the, and the symptoms are going down, our immune system has to recover from that. And that's difficult. And if our immune system hasn't already recovered from that because they're still fighting the battle, um, then we're still susceptible to a secondary infection. Then lastly, we have our period of convalescence. So this is when the patient returns to the normal function. So we go from kind of feeling yuck still, but we're getting over it, to 
feeling just totally normal again. Now, sometimes though, some diseases can inflict permanent damage and the body cannot fully repair. So we might end up um, having these signs and these symptoms. And then at the end of it, we don't return back to normal, as I was saying. You know, we might have we might not have any more pathogen particles, but we may still have some permanent damage from the actual infection itself. All five periods, the incubation period, the prodromal period, the period of illness, the period of decline, and the period of convalescence. All of those periods of time, somebody can pass that along to somebody else. <clears throat> so when we're talking about um, something being contagious, something being able to pass from person to person, a person or an infectious disease can be contagious during all five periods. So if we look back for a moment, now when we talk about different organisms or um, different ways of transferring it um, or passing it along, um, then we're going to be considering um, which of the periods we're in. So um, the periods of disease, there are some that are more likely to pass along the organism and some that are less likely, even though throughout the entire, all of the periods, you, a person can be contagious. <clears throat> but our periods of disease that are more likely are going to depend on the particular disease, for example, as we already mentioned, some are easier to pass on than others, um, and that's related to the disease. Related to the pathogen, so, it, you know, if it's a, an acellular pathogen, so something like a virus, it has to be in a cell in order for it to function or continue, you know, functioning. Um, not living. I hesitated to say living because it's not a living thing, but um, to function still. And so if it stays outside of the body for a certain period of time, so say four hours or something, depending on the organism, then it might not be able to be transmitted still. Um, mechanism by which the disease develops and progresses. So it depends on how that disease works. Um, and so if we're in a particular um, period of disease, the way that disease develops may make it um, more likely to be transmitted during one period of time versus another period of time. So for example, meningitis, which is the infection of the lining of the brain, of the brain or inflammation of the brain linings, the meninges. For a bacterial infection, if bacterial, if it was a bacterial infection that caused the meningitis, the inflammation of the lining of the brain, during the incubation period and up to a week before the prodromal, prodromal period is when that is contagious. Now, if it's a viral version that's causing the, the meningitis, then it's going to be contagious during the first signs and symptoms in the prodromal period up here. So as soon as that person starts to kind of feel yucky, they're already passing it on, and that's when it's more likely to be transmitted. Versus the bacterial meningitis is during the incubation period. So when people have no idea, they don't even know that they're starting to feel a little bit ill, they can pass that along. <clears throat> For some viral rash diseases, something like chickenpox or measles, um, when they are most contagious, is during the incubation period and up to a week before the rash appears. Um, so a lot of these, it's before we're even seeing these signs and symptoms in the incubation period. For respiratory infections, something like the cold, the flu, strep throat, this is most often transmitted or is contagious more so uh, at the onset of the prodromal period. So at the beginning of when a person is just starting to feel kind of yucky is when they're um, able to pass this on more easily. So it's more likely for transmission. And diarrheal, uh, diarrheal diseases, they can pass these on past the period of illness. So when we're in the decline period or we're in the convalescence period, um, this is when diarrheal Ill diseases are passed on most often <clears throat> is because they're at that, that part and they're already past that and they're passing all of that through the body and getting it out of the body. And if it's still alive at that point, it can be transmitted to other people. So when we are talking about diseases, we can think in two terms here, um, acute disease and chronic disease. <clears throat> and we've already mentioned this a little bit depending on um, the particular type of pathogen, and we mentioned that some illnesses are going to cause permanent damage and, and have chronic disease, particularly when we talk about something like HIV, um, where it's putting its DNA, uh, well, it doesn't have DNA, but it, it makes DNA and puts it into 
uh, the immune system cells, the CD4 cells. And that would be a chronic disease versus something like the flu, which is an acute disease. So the, the definitions for these are that an acute disease is when we have pathologic changes occurring over a short period of time. Acute means a short period of time. So this is something like eight hours, days, or weeks. And then there are a rapid onset of conditions. So when we think of an acute disease, we think of something like the flu, for example. Our incubation period is one to two days. We can spread it for about five days after becoming ill. And then in the period of decline is about one week. So the flu can generally be about a week long, two weeks long, something like that. That's considered an acute disease. When we're talking about a chronic disease, these are where we have pathologic changes over a longer period of time, like months, years, or an entire lifetime. So for example, chronic gastritis, which itis is inflammation of the stomach lining, <clears throat> for example, H. pylori is going to produce urease to survive in the high acid of the stomach. And since it produces this urease constantly and it's, it's um, producing it and just excreting it, um, it creates this environment that is welcoming for it rather than being um, destroyed by that high acid. And so then it can survive indefinitely. It's very, very hard to get rid of the um, H. pylori when it's infected. <clears throat> Another term, a third term, is a latent disease. So we have an acute disease and a chronic disease. Those are more uh, active infections, even if it is chronic and long-term. Um, and then when we have something that is not um, actually actively causing something, that's a latent disease. So this is when the causal pathogen goes dormant for extended periods of time with no active replication. Uh, so we see this in example for chicken pox. Somebody can get chicken pox when they're a child, for example, and then when they get older, they're an adult, they end up getting shingles. And this is related to it coming back, basically. It's, it's coming out of dormancy, and it's going to be vegetative again, and it starts to multiply, and once it multiplies, it colonizes, and then it causes these signs and symptoms. And this is oftentimes some of these um, that we're going to talk about are triggered to, due to stress conditions. So <clears throat> if the body is stressed, then it has a weakened immune system. And if it has a weakened immune system, that's a really good time for a pathogen to take advantage of the host. Um, so that's why we see something like if a person had chicken pox, and then later on in life, oftentimes people get shingles when they're really stressed out about something because stress causes a decrease in our immune system. And then that organism is saying, like, oh, this is a good time to take over. I've got a good chance at taking over this organism. So that's when we see a recurrence. Another example is mononucleosis. When it comes back later, after being a latent disease, we have Epstein-Barr virus, <clears throat> and it can eventually cause uh, B-cell lymphoma. Um, it's possible that it can cause uh, B-cell lymphoma, which can be a problem or a long-term um, problem coming from a latent disease where a person had mononucleosis first, then it can come back, it can be Epstein-Barr virus, and then progress into B-cell lymphoma. <clears throat> Oftentimes, these are evading immune systems, right? Because if it's latent, that means it's still hanging out in the body somewhere, which means the immune system didn't go out and it didn't get it and it didn't kill it and get rid of it. And that's because it evades the immune system. And it's typically because it's latent in immune cells. And so the immune cells are the ones that are out there trying to get the bad guys, but they oftentimes then, in, the, in these cases, they're carrying uh, the bad guys, for example. <clears throat> So then a person will become infectious during periods of stress and immunosuppression. So stress causes immunosuppression, but other reasons for immunosuppression, like if you are fighting off some other illness, for example. Um, if you're fighting off another illness, then you may get shingles on top of it because the body says, oh, good time to take over, and it, it comes out of hiding or dormancy. 